Hey guys, Aaron Cybertron Zhang here, and today I am bringing you my team building guide for the Pokemon VGC 2020 format. Super excited to share this guide with you. I've been working really hard to make this in the last week or so, and I am pretty happy with the end product. I do think this guide will cover a lot of different things, so please feel free to skip along in the timestamps in the description below if you want to jump to certain points, uh, because it's going to be covering a lot of different things, like I mentioned. So if you are new to this channel, welcome. My name is Aaron, and I've been a competitive Pokemon VGC player since 2008. In more recent years, I've transitioned over to becoming a commentator for the Pokemon Company International and a content creator on YouTube. The goal of this channel and this video is really to share my love of competitive Pokemon and VGC with as many people as possible, and maybe inspire you guys to get into playing competitive VGC. Uh, VGC is a super, super awesome format and game, and with Sword and Shield, I think there is a big potential to get as many people as possible into the game. So, really excited to do this video. If you do enjoy, please share your support by leaving a like in the video, sharing it with anyone that might be interested, and of course, giving me any feedback and letting me know what future guides you want to see. Without further ado, let's just jump into things. First of all, this guide is just going to cover what the VGC 2020 rule set even is and what VGC is, because some people watching this might not know or have heard of VGC before. It's going to talk about what makes it different from single battles, which is, I think, what a lot of people are used to playing. I'm going to be giving you guys a list of top resources that I like to use when I'm building my teams. I'm going to be talking about some of the Pokemon that you can expect to see and Pokemon and strategies that are currently common in the early metagame. I'm going to be talking about the process for actually building a team, that's the meat of this guide obviously, and then dive into some specific details about team building, such as how you should be constructing EV spreads and movesets. I do want to caveat that with the fact that that part will not be super fleshed out, I will make future guides on that in the future, but it's basically to help you understand how to have like very basic EV spreads that will help you uh, win in the very beginning uh, when you're starting out, so yeah. So, what is VGC? What is the 2020 rule set? Well, first of all, VGC stands for the Video Game Championships, and this is the rule set that we use for live Pokemon tournaments held by the Pokemon Company International. Culminates in the World Championships every year. If you've ever tuned into the Pokemon World Championships, well, this is the format that we play with. There are double battles always, and one thing that makes them kind of unique is that you have a team of six Pokemon, but you're only choosing four in a battle, which makes the team building process, I think, a little bit more interesting. I'll talk about that more a little bit in the future. Um, I'm not going to dive into a lot of the specifics here. If you want to learn more about this, feel free to follow along with the video that I made last week covering the rule set. Most important things are basically uh, all your Pokemon have to be from uh, Galar, so they have to be bred or caught in Galar, uh, and they have to be in the Galar decks. Uh, pretty much everything is loud except for certain mythical and legendary Pokemon, uh, or not certain, just all of them pretty much. Um, all your Pokemon are set to level 50, Dynamax is allowed, and finally G-Max is allowed, but on an expanding basis. Uh, I, I think a lot of people that don't know anything about VGC were confused by this, so basically um, there are certain G-Max Pokemon that are easier to get in-game because their spawn rates have increased, so in this month I think like Butterfree and Snorlax, for example, have increased spawn rates. Uh, other Pokemon that are G-Max Pokemon are still really hard to get from raids, so as uh, Pokemon bas basically increases the spawn rates of certain G-Max Pokemon, then those Pokemon will most likely be allowed in the format. So right now we only have 10 G-Max Pokemon that are even allowed, and as the year progresses, more of those might be allowed. Hard to say which ones exactly, like whether all of them will be released or whether it's only going to be certain ones, so, you know, time will basically, we have to wait and see. Uh, but the key thing is Dynamax is allowed and a uh, fair amount of G-Max Pokemon are allowed, and that list will expand gradually as the year goes along based off the spawn rates uh, increasing for certain Pokemon. So, yeah. Double battles, though, uh, which makes things really, really interesting to begin with, and I think for a lot of players, you might be wondering, what's the difference from singles if you've never played doubles? First of all, team preview is much more important, especially if you're used to 6v6 singles, such as, you know, the standard Smogon rules, and... The reason for that is because obviously in 6v6, you pretty much use team preview to obviously see what your opponent has, but also just pick your lead matchup. In doubles, because you only get to bring four Pokemon, every Pokemon you bring is super, super important. It also means that the team building process is also more interesting because you can't just bring every Pokemon to every match. You have to make sure that each of them fulfills a certain role and that any combination or any four you know Pokemon out of your six can potentially win against your opponent's six. So that certainly makes the dynamic a little bit more interesting. Uh, I think a lot of singles players are used to certain strategies such as hazards from stealth rocks and spikes, stall strategies such as, um, you know, just having like really bulky Pokemon and uh, stalling your opponent out with status conditions, for example, and maybe sweeping with one Pokemon. All of those are less common in VGC, like they 
kind of exist occasionally. Hazards install really not too much. Some stall strategies have popped up throughout the years, but these are typically not strategies that are winning major tournaments. Sweeping with one Pokemon, definitely a little bit more viable in VGC, especially because with Dynamax and Weakness Policy now implemented, you do see that, but uh, it still it doesn't feel like to the extent that we see often in singles, mainly because there's just so many more Pokemon that you have to consider. Uh, Protect is an essential move, and for a lot of players transitioning from singles that are building VGC teams, I often see them not running Protect on pretty much any Pokemon. It's a really good move, and you want to run it on a lot of Pokemon, because if you don't have Protect on anything, then it'll be really easy for your opponent to just get quick knockouts and target things. Uh, Protect basically adds significantly more mind games, which makes the game harder for your opponent, and makes it easier for you. In general, there are significantly more move options, and uh, obviously, you know, you have four attacks on both Pokemon, either of them can switch out at any point, either of them can Dynamax, and so, uh, because of that, there's just a lot more going on at every given point in the game. And Dynamax and GMAX operate a little bit differently than how I've seen it from singles. In my opinion, these mechanics don't seem super balanced for singles, but they seem very, very optimized and kind of really meant for double battles. So let's actually talk about how that affects, you know, the team building process and why it, it is kind of unique. Uh, first of all, I think a lot of people initially saw Dynamax and GMAX kind of like as an offensive tool, right? We just get extra damage from all these max attacks that are really powerful. But for doubles, the side effects are actually incredibly inc important. Uh, and a lot of teams early on don't really revolve around Dynamaxing or GMAXing just one Pokemon. Like, I, I think uh, the mark of a really good team for doubles or for VGC is a team that can ideally Dynamax with any Pokemon. You might have one or two that you'll prioritize Dynamaxing, for example, a weakness policy Pokemon, or maybe like GMAX Norlax, for example. But ideally, you'll have a team where all the other Pokemon can also reasonably Dynamax and put themselves in good positions based off what your opponent, uh, what you're going up against in your opponent. So for double battles, there's so many reasons to Dynamax, right? You have the early pressure um, that you might get from, for example, speed boost from Max Airstream, uh, early defense, for example, protecting yourself from trick room teams or offensive teams by getting some defense or special defense boosts, uh, late game sweeping where you kind of stall out your opponent's Dynamax and then you kind of just sweep through with one really, really heavy hitter, or even Dynamaxing simply for the case of using Max Guard to protect yourself from any damage or side effects. The key point of this is that Dynamax is a lot more fluid in VGC and doubles, and as a result, um, you know, I think like teams aren't going to typically revolve around them, but they certainly can need to you know, take this into consideration because there's a lot of cool stuff that you can do with Dynamax. So, what are the fundamentals of top VGC teams? Well, these are kind of, you know, it, it's hard to really go into the specifics, but for me, I think top VGC teams typically will have all of these covered. They'll have balanced typing and coverage across the board. What does that mean? It means that, you know, none of their Pokemon are all the same type. You have good uh, offense. You can, you know, do at least neutral damage to every type in the format and every Pokemon in the format. And you can also have resistances to every common type and attack, basically. Uh, typically, you want speed control, at least one big way of controlling the speed, whether that's Tailwind, whether that's Trick Room, whether that's Thunder Wave, whether that's Icy Wind. Speed control is incredibly important in VGC, especially because it's double battles. You typically want a mix of both special and physical attackers, as well as offensive and defensive members. You don't really want to stay committed too much to one archetype, or one kind of uh, offense or defense, for example. If your team is entirely too defensive, you just won't have enough damage to really do uh, distribute around. Or if your team is too uh, physical, for example, then you will lose to things that have like a lot of Intimidators or will o users. You just want to balance so that it gives you more outs against different teams, basically. Uh, you really don't want to be extremely weak to any one top Pokemon or strategy. For example, if you have a glaring weakness to something that's really common, like Hatterene in DD. You should probably go back to the drawing board and fix that on in the team building process because uh, the mark of a good team is one that has good matchups against ideally almost everything, but also has very good answers against the most common Pokemon and strategies. Because if you're not prepared for those, then you're going to have a tough time because you're going to encounter them quite a lot. Um, you, you know, this kind of goes into all the points we were talking about earlier, but you don't want to be too reliant on any one specific strategy. Uh, for example, hard trick room is a strategy that we see often, and it is good, but it is hard to really commit to because. Uh, in, in those kind of strategies, they're not really flexible, and if your opponent shuts you down, for example, denies you Trick Room, then it will be really difficult for you to win the game. So you want flexibility in, in terms of not revolving around just saying, okay, I always click Trick Room and then I win the game from there. Um, you want more flexibility with that in general. Uh, one thing that's new, I, I think will be important for top VGC teams is the flexibility with Dynamax slash GMAX. I think, like I mentioned earlier, you don't want just one Pokemon to be Dynamaxing every game, and you might prioritize one or two Pokemon Dynamaxing, but ideally a good team will have... Uh, you know, a, a team where like maybe five or even all six Pokemon can Dynamax at some given situation. Um, so I think, yeah, when you're building a team, I wouldn't say commit too hard, committing too hard to just one Pokemon, um, especially with their Dynamax and GMAX features. Overall, for a top VGC team, you want all six Pokemon to play an integral role to the team. Doesn't mean you have to bring all six Pokemon in every game. Obviously you can't, but for example, I think, um, 
some top VGC teams, you might bring five Pokemon almost every time, and then the last Pokemon is used specifically as a tech matchup for maybe like a very obscure Pokemon or strategy that you really have a bad matchup against. It's not like you necessarily need to bring all six uh, throughout the course of a tournament even. Ideally though, you will, and what's more important is that they will cover your bases and that any four of the six will give you good answers, uh, and more specifically, like each of them cover their bases. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in the actual team building process, but the mark of a good VGC team, I think, is one where you can say, wow, each of these Pokemon really contributes something to the team. Even if I'm not bringing it, for example, even if you just have it in team preview and can scare things off, that in itself can have an important effect on your team. So you want all six Pokemon to really, really be important. And that's obvious, but I think that's something that people really need to be reminded of. So before we actually jump into things, here are a list of top resources that I really like to use for team building. Maryland's Pokemon Team Builder allows you to, you know, see what weaknesses that your Pokemon have. Uh, and I think that's important because one thing that's important for building a team is just not being too weak to any certain Pokemon or type. Uh, Trainer Tower and Victory Road are two of the best VGC resources around. They have articles constantly. They have a lot of great other resources. For example, Trainer Tower has a damage calculator, which I use all the time. Uh, both of those websites have rental teams that also have showdown exports. So if you want to try out certain strategies and see how top players are building their Pokemon, you can just try out one of the rental teams. I'll talk more about that in the future as well. Uh, VGC stats and Reddit slash VGC, both of those are really, really great too. Uh, VGC stats is a uh, Twitter and website that basically updates with uh, major tournament results. Uh, frequently and allows you to see what Pokemon are being used. They also are running a really, really cool weekly tournament circuit right now um, that has been pretty close to the VGC rule set, and I think in the future weeks they will match the 2020 rule set. So you can follow them on Twitter to see what top Pokemon are being used, how the metagame is really changing, and uh, you know, this team building guide is being made in the early metagame, so things will change drastically as the metagame progresses, but if you follow these resources, then you'll be able to keep up with what is really picking up in popularity and what might not be as popular. If you use Reddit, r slash VGC is an excellent resource for beginners especially. There's a ton of great people working behind the scenes to really help guide people into competitive VGC, and uh, you can definitely ask questions about like team building, for example, there as well. A uh, couple of other resources I really like, Picolytics is great, it basically shows you statistics from all Pokemon used on Pokemon Showdown, so if you want to see how people are using a certain Pokemon, you can just type it in there, it'll show you the moves, partners, EV spreads, items, uh, and it shows you it for pretty much every Pokemon, so really love that resource, especially if you want to use a more obscure Pokemon, you don't know how people are trying it out, that's a great website to go to. Uh, finally, there are a couple of great uh, resources outside of these websites. Um, there is a uh, VGC20 Pokemon Attribute Sheet that was created by uh, Khalid, and this is really, really cool because uh, it basically shows you base stats of all the Pokemon, what moves they have, whether they have Fake Out, whether they have Thunder Wave, Intimidate, and all that stuff. So uh, that's a great source to check if you are looking for a certain thing to add to your team. Like, let's say you want an Icy Wind user. Well, that sheet will show you, uh, and it'll show you all the Pokemon in the 2020 format as well. A uh, user called Jory VGC made a Showdown Usage Stats um, uh, like spreadsheet slash google drive which has been really cool too it's basically more advanced picolytics where it will show you like the percentage distribution of how players are training their pokemon and you can get more nuanced details from that so i've really really enjoyed seeing that so far and it breaks down uh really everything for a lot of the top pokemon are being used right now so also great resources that uh, that will hopefully be updated throughout the course of the year uh, and finally, uh, the world champion from 2017, uh, Baradoru, made a really cool Season 1 ranked double summary. Uh, the format that we're playing for ranked online is a little bit different from the 2020 format, with the main difference being GMAX, uh, not being allowed in online doubles. But it's still a really, really helpful guide, and Habiki, who's been one of the top contributors and content creators, actually translated it. Uh, and that will actually be really helpful if you're looking to counter like certain strategies and cores that are common right now in the 2020 format. So um, that's a really, really helpful resource as well, uh, especially if you just want easy answers against some of the more common cores that we're going up against currently. And finally, various content creators like Wolfie Glick and Francesco Pardini create individual Pokemon guides, and these are really great guides for you if you just want to get started, don't know how to use a Pokemon. These are two of the best players around and they have been making really great content as well so all of these are in linked in the description below i wanted to just briefly touch on them in case you didn't know what they are and what they do and yeah i love all these resources i use all of them when i'm building my teams and you should have all of them bookmarked uh, these are some of the best sources out there basically for team building so let's actually jump a little bit into the 2020 format and talk about pokemon that you can expect to see First of all, here are some early metagame strategies to prepare for that you will definitely run into if you're playing online or on Pokemon Showdown. 
You have Hard Trick Room from things like Hatterene and NDD. Uh, you have Weather, Tyrannotronic Schedule is really common, but Pelipper Ludicolo is definitely seen as well. You have Tailwind, uh, Whimsicott's the most common Tailwind user, but you also see things like Braviary and Corviknight, and that's often paired with really strong sweepers, such as Draco Vision Excadrill. Uh, we've seen some early shenanigans with Beat Up, that's typically on something like Whimsicott, for example. You pair that up with something like uh, Arcanine and Lucario, which is justified, and give them some big stat increases immediately. Uh, dual Screens, like Clay Grimmsnarl, plus bulky Pokemon like Assault Vest or Ludon, for example, uh, is quite common as well, especially because with all this bulk, it can be really uh, hard to just get damage consistently every turn. Uh, weakness policy is commonly seen with a lot of the aforementioned strategies, whether it be, for example, Hard Trick Room or Weather. Um, and the goal of this is basically you Dynamax your Pokemon, you either proc your weakness policy by yourself using something like Surf, for example, or they just activate naturally because Pokemon like Tyranitar and Rhyperior have a lot of weaknesses, but they're also so bulky when they're Dynamax where they'll be able to take advantage of the weakness policy. Um, Speed control from Max Airstream Dynamax is also pretty common. I've seen it on things like Corviknight, Braviary, Gyarados, I mean any flying type Pokemon pretty much. And that's another way to control the speed which is pretty fun outside of just your conventional Trick Room and Tailwind. Uh, finally, G-Max Norlax uh, with teams that have you know bulky Pokemon that are using berries I think is going to be quite common as well, especially earlier on. And you might see that, for example, on Trick Room teams uh, because Norlax is a relatively slow Pokemon. So these are, obviously it's not a full list of everything you're going to run into, but you'll definitely see this in a fair amount of your battle so these are all things you should definitely be prepared for and you should consider while you're building your team this is a list of old pokemon that you should definitely expect to see obviously there are more pokemon than just this but these are pokemon that i've seen a bunch of and run into and top teams have been using them in the last couple of weeks or so so yeah i won't really dive into the specifics but wanted to make this graphic for you so that you could see exactly what is pretty common right now Similarly, there is a list of obviously newer Pokemon you should expect to see, and that is the case with these as well. I've run into all of these already while playing competitively, and, uh, you know, these lists are definitely not fleshed out, right? Like, there are so many Pokemon that are allowed, and a lot of Pokemon that can be viable, it's just that between the two of these, these are just the Pokemon that you'll probably encounter more frequently, at least for now. As the format progresses, you might run into more obscure Pokemon that can be tournament winning. Um, it's just, it might not be as common uh, and might not be on everyone's team. For the most part, these are Pokemon that you can expect to see on like the majority of teams that you run into. So you might want to consider building around them or of course countering them when you're building your team. Uh, we talked about G-Max earlier, so these are the list of G-Max Pokemon that are currently allowed, so it's not a very extensive list, um, there's only 10 and 3 of them being Eevee, Pikachu, and Meowth, making them, you know, not super relevant. So you can definitely expect to see teams bolt around some of these, I mean, like, they all have some pretty cool side effects. Uh, Charizard doesn't get access to Solar Power, so that makes it, unfortunately, a little weaker, but these are all allowed currently as of January 4th, which is the first day of VGC 2020 officially. As for future releases, I think Grimmsnarl and Hatterene can have a big impact on the metagame, and then there are a bunch of other ones that have interesting side effects, but uh, we're not going to talk about this too much right now because we don't know if slash when they will be released, so for the purpose of this guide, um, in the future, you know, it might impact the metagame, but for right now, they are not part of the format, so don't really want to dive too deep into it. But yeah, that covers a lot of the Pokemon that you should expect to see and maybe want to play around. If you are curious about some of how the top teams are currently built in the metagame, this is a good, you know, graphic for it. I just, you know, selected some of the top teams that I've seen running around that I think were really cool. So, um, the first two were built by two of the top players from the world. Uh, Edu, who's been streaming a lot. Seijun, who's also the 2014 Pokemon World Champion. Uh, you know, Edu running kind of this tailwind team, uh, with a lot of, uh, fast hitters like Dragapult, but you also, also got like some bulk on the Gastrodon, Seijun running a Trick Room team, which was really cool. Uh, the bottom three teams are all teams that performed really well in the Galar Weekly that's held by VGC Stats, so these all were top performing teams, and uh, um, they're all from different weeks as well, which is pretty cool. So in the first week, Nails won with this, you know, Whimsicott Tailwind team. In the second week, Lucas introduced this um, Weezing team that was really cool. And in the last week, we saw Tup Puck get second place with a really cool Trick Room team featuring stuff like Delmize and Butterfree. So from this, you can see how some of the top teams are being composed right now. Yeah, some Pokemon occur pretty frequently, like Excadrill or Whimsicott, for example, but there are a lot of Pokemon that are viable, and these are just some of the cool top teams that I've seen in the first couple of weeks um, of the metagame. Uh, it's important to know that these players were not playing the VGC 2020 metagame. They were playing um, the Battle Stadium doubles metagame, which means, you know, GMAX weren't allowed in the tournaments that they were playing in. But for the most part, I think uh, a lot of the teams that we will see will be kind of similar to top compositions from uh, the early Battle Stadium metagame. So yeah, if you're curious of 
these teams. Uh, I'll link all the Twitters of these players in the description below as well. So feel free to contact them if you want to learn more about the actual composition or whatnot. But this should give you some sense of how teams are built. You know, you can see speed control on all of these, whether it be Trick Room or Tailwind. You can see a uh, good amount of distribution between special and physical bulk and damage output and overall just great team type synergy as a whole. So I've been talking for a long time. I know you guys have been waiting for me to actually talk about the team building process. So let's just actually dive into it. If you've watched my previous VGC team building guides, this is very similar to it. Just basically edit it for VGC 2020 because the fundamentals are still the same for building a team. But if you are new, then yeah, this will be new knowledge for you. So to me, basically how I approach team building is I typically start with the core. Uh, you know, this is normally one to three Pokemon that I basically build around. And this core can revolve around different strategies, whether it be Tailwind, Trick Room, beat up uh, some more fun stuff like perish song for example there's a lot of stuff that you can choose your core of and that's completely up to you once we build that core we basically want to add some supporting members to basically make it a little bit stronger we want to give it the right support whether it be fake out users whether it be speed control or whatnot afterwards we i do what i call kind of like a domino effect where you basically as you add pokemon to your team look for what weaknesses are really open and try to patch those weaknesses with each next pokemon and i'll talk a little bit more about that in just a bit and finally the uh, once you're done building the team uh and you're done with the first draft you want to test and adjust it because no team is ever going to be uh, perfect and certainly not when you first build it you're going to realize a lot of weaknesses as you actually go along so those are all really important so Choosing a Pokemon slash strategy and actually building a core. Typically, you want to choose, you know, either a Pokemon you're really interested in or a cool strategy to build around. Some examples, for example, are speed control. So maybe you want to play with a Tailwind team, a Trick Room team, or even Max Airstream. You want to look for Pokemon that can thrive under those, for example. So for Tailwind teams, you know, Pokemon that are in like the mid-speed tier. For Trick Room teams, Pokemon that are in like the lower speed tier. Max Airstream, kind of similar to Tailwind. Uh, of course, you can also start with a certain Pokemon, such as Pokemon with high base stats or unique abilities. Dracovish is obviously one of the more popular Pokemon from the newer set of Pokemon. And for those, you, you kind of want to look at, okay, how do I make this Pokemon work? What needs, what, what proper support basically does it need? Other cool strategies you might want to consider, for example, activating uh, your own weakness policy is kind of cool. So one example of this is uh, Surf from something like Weavile or... Uh, Dragapult and then targeting it with like your uh, Colossal or Tyranitar for example. Uh, Parasong is a cool strategy, Speed Swap is a cool strategy, there are tons of other strategies that don't revolve around just you know speed control or Pokemon um, and for those that is going to be a little bit nuanced and I think a little bit uh, tougher to build around so as a result you really need to support the core properly. Uh, what's important is you want to make look at what makes the Pokemon and your strategy unique and then focus on highlighting those strengths right so for Tailwind uh, teams that op typically under operate under Tailwind are you have like Pokemon that are just really really hard hitting and so you want to utilize those three turns really well um if you bring a really slow Pokemon to a Tailwind team, for example, they probably won't even be able to take advantage of Tailwind. So you want to find the synergies that basically exist based off the effects that you're getting from these different strategies. Um, and then you basically want to build a core around your chosen Pokemon and your strategy. In my head, cores typically revolve around some kind of synergy, right? So you want cores that uh, are good defensively, good offensively, uh, take advantage of speed control, like I mentioned, uh, take advantage of certain uh, unique strategies like proccing your weakness policy or whatnot. So. If you are wondering, you know, like, what does a core mean? First of all, you can check out that article I mentioned earlier by uh, Baraduro and Hibiki that covers a bunch of the more common cores, such as Tarantar, Excadrill, uh, Pelipper, Ludicolo, for example. Uh, and that will give you some, uh, a good starting point, basically. But um, I wanted to give some examples. So, for example, let's say you want to build a Trick Room team. Uh, well, for a Trick Room team, you want to start off with a Trick Room user, right? So you, you add that to the team. You then want to find a support Pokemon that can uh, help you set up Trick Room, whether it be a Fake Out user or a Follow Me user. Those are typically good for Trick Room users. So NDD and Hatterene, you know, one of the most common duos that we see currently. And then you want to add a Pokemon that can really sweep through teams. So Torkoal is a good example here. This is like a very basic core where, okay, now you've established, okay, I've got my strategy set up. I've got something to sweep under it. Now let's look for the weaknesses and patch it around it. Similarly, for Tailwind, for example, you want at least one Tailwind user. You want a Pokemon that can really take advantage of the Tailwind. So Dracovish being kind of in that mid-tier speed, uh, speed stat, but can hit really hard is perfect for that. And you want like a support Pokemon. So Rotom Wash is a great utility Pokemon that can spread burns, can Volt Switch out, uh, and can just kind of be annoying to deal with. And uh, if you're starting with a specific Pokemon rather than say like a speed control metric or a strategy, you really want to look at what speed control or support is needed for that Pokemon. So for example, if you're using a Pokemon that's really slow, well, you'll probably want something that can maybe set up Trick Room so that Pokemon can thrive under Trick Room. If you're using something really fast, you'll probably want to support it with like Fake Out, for example, or Bulk. Um, or things that can uh, set up screens, for example, things that can kind of hamper down your opponent so that the 
fast sweeper sticks around for a little bit longer it's very dependent on that pokemon so you want to look basically at what makes it unique uh where its weaknesses are and then patch up those weaknesses so uh, two of the most common cores that we see around are basically Trick Room and Tailwind, so I just wanted to make a graphic for both of those to show you, you know, some of the common Pokemon that are used under it. So, this is Trick Room, tons of Trick Room users up there that are viable and being used currently, and there's even more that I haven't included. Um, a lot of attackers, like Rhyperior and Torkoal, are really common, but you also see a lot of other stuff, and as GMAX Norlax becomes allowed, that will also be pretty prevalent. And then you've got a you know a bunch of different support Pokemon that all have different features, whether it be Intimidate, Fake Out, Will-O-Wisp, or Follow Me, for example. So this is what uh, a Trick Room team might look like, and I would say if you run into a Trick Room team, we'll have at least a couple of these Pokemon from this core. You basically want to add something from the first row, the second row, and the third row. Similarly with Tailwind, um, you know there aren't too many viable Tailwind users, not as many as Trick Room users. As a result, the pool is kind of smaller, but you will see things like Braviary, Whimsicott, and Corviknight a lot. Um, a bunch of really strong sweepers that we've seen early metagame, uh, and then of course support Pokemon once again, like the Rotom forms, which can once again uh, spread Will-O-Wisp, Gastrodon, which can just stick around for a long time and kind of annoy your opponent, and something like Grim Snarl, which has dual screens. So if you don't know where to start, these are definitely good starting points. Like feel free to just take a look at these graphics and then just add a, you know a, a bunch of these Pokemon together. Um, because there definitely will be just some inherent synergies based off uh, the Pokemon that are on these two lists. So, after you've actually determined your core, you basically want to support it. And uh, the main thing is basically identifying the main weaknesses of your core and patching them up. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, a great VGC team will be multi-dimensional, so you want to make use of all six of your Pokemon, and that, you know, you basically want the future Pokemon you add to your team to cover up weaknesses that your core has. So a lot of weaknesses that I see, especially from starting players, are, for example, lack of synergy between your Pokemon, whether that means they are all the same type, they all have the same weaknesses, they don't really have enough coverage against uh, different types of Pokemon and strategies. Um, I also often see too much reliance on one strategy or Pokemon, so hard committing to whether it's like activating your weakness policy or setting up Trick Room. You don't want that. You want a team that can play around a bunch of different situations. Uh, a lot of teams often are also just too weak to a specific strategy or Pokemon, so you want to make sure you have decent answers against all the common Pokemon, as I mentioned multiple times. And often a lot of teams don't have enough variance in speed, so you might just have Pokemon that are all really fast, but those teams will really struggle against Trick Room teams. or hard trick room teams where everything's really slow and if you don't get trick room up you're pretty much always going to be attacking last so variance and speed is also good because it'll give you some good answers against various means of speed control so when you're considering support pokemon and how to, how to support your cast like this is just a sample list of some utility pokemon like you can add to your teams for example um a trick room users are fun. Something like Mimikyu is fun because you can not only use it to set up trick room, but you can also reverse your opponent's trick room. So you don't necessarily need it to always, you know, guarantee trick room. It can be used just for mind games. Uh, we've talked about Tailwind users, but there's a ton of different utility that's used in VGC as well. That's obviously like less common in uh, singles. Uh, fake out and intimidate aren't nearly as good as they used to be, but they are still certainly relevant, and there are a bunch of good fake out and intimidate users. Uh, Burn is great from the Rotom forms, from Arcanine, from Mimikyu, from anything like in Will O Wisp. Obviously, Dragapult can even do it which is kind of cool. Um, there also aren't too many redirection users, but we often see things like the um, NDD and the Togekiss being used. Uh, and in general, the last row shows you a bunch of different support Pokemon that you can use for general utility. So Grimmsnarl, for example, can set up screens. Milotic can go for Icy Winds. Um, Weezing can shut down abilities. Arcanine can intimidate and spread burns. And Whimsicott basically does everything. Like you can uh, taunt, you can Encore, you can Tailwind, you can Trick Room. You can do a ton of different things with it. So once again, this is not like a fully fleshed out list, but they are Pokemon that you might want to consider when you're trying to add Pokemon to your team because a lot of times I think what I see is a lot of players just adding six Pokemon that do a lot of damage, right? But they don't really have synergy and they don't have ways to really support it. Adding even one Intimidator can help you out a lot because it can basically make your opponent's team weaker. Uh, fake out users allow you to use more cool moves such as setup moves or a speed control. Uh, burning your opponent can be really good, especially in this metagame, which is more physically oriented as well. Redirection allows you to get your guarantee to like, uh, you know, allows you to set up and protect, for example, your Dynamax Pokemon or allows you to set up your speed control. So these are just some Pokemon you may want to consider adding onto your team as you are fleshing out this core and figuring out its main weaknesses. Afterwards is the domino effect, which I think is pretty similar to the last step, but basically as you add Pokemon, you want to keep building off what you already have, and you don't want to just add Pokemon randomly. I think if you are if you are to add Pokemon that you want to use randomly, you should do that in the beginning of the team building process when you're building a core, because once you've established a core, you want to keep identifying the weaknesses of your core and make sure that you're patching those, basically. So, for example, as I'm adding Pokemon to a team that I build, I'll always consider the role of the Pokemon. Does it serve, serve a unique role? For example, if I already have a fake out user, do I really need to add another one? If I have him on top already, Scrafty kind of does the same thing, right? So 
I should probably pick one of the two rather than have both of them, unless my strategy is really committed to using both. Uh, the typing is also really important. I keep talking about this because these are just things that you should really have ingrained in your mind. So, you know, you don't want to have too many Pokemon of the same type. You want different uh, typings overall, both in terms of your Pokemon, so from a defensive standpoint, but also from an office standpoint. Uh, once again, the physical versus special split is really important. You want to, you normally don't want to be too committed onto one side. You want to have a good balance between the two and have sweepers that are either both physical or special. Um, the overall speed of your team, as I mentioned, is important. Once again, you don't want to be too committed to a single speed tier. You want Pokemon that probably range in speeds and like uh, ones that can take advantage of your speed control, but also can counter potential opposing speed control, right? For example, if you have a really slow Pokemon on your team, and you're going up against a Trick Room team, even if the rest of your team operates under Tailwind, well, this Pokemon alone can be brought to deal with a uh, Trick Room team. So uh, that's important to remember. And finally, the overall offense and bulk of your team, you want to be able to distribute enough damage and you don't want to be too frail overall. You, you want a good balance between the two. Finally, once you have done all of this, you basically want to test and adjust your team. I know whenever I build a team, after even playing a few games, I've probably replaced one Pokemon for another Pokemon at that point because I realized, hey, this Pokemon really doesn't do anything for me. It was cool in theory, but in execution, not really great. So I normally go on Pokemon Showdown first, play a couple games, see how it fares and see where like the obvious weaknesses are. And some things I always ask myself are what Pokemon are dead weight for me? Like what Pokemon am I never bringing and why is that the case? If I'm not bringing it ever, is that because... Um, it offers absolutely nothing or is it still helpful enough where even in team preview can add some mind games for example having a trick room pokemon or having a galarian wheezing even if you're not bringing to the game can make your opponent think twice about how they bring the pokemon so they do have like a passive uh impact so you want to see if there's any pokemon that don't just have like relatively no impact at all those are the pokemon you want to replace you also constantly want to ask yourself whether the pokemon on your team are doing the the best job they can or whether there's a pokemon that can better fulfill the same role uh and with that you can kind of just you know look at what pokemon are just not being used to the full extent and ask yourself okay is there anything that can replace this but can do it uh, better you want to as always ask yourself are you struggling with a certain pokemon or matchup what is leading to that and is your team one dimensional uh, once you find the answers to this, like losses are so good when you start playing games with a new team because they'll help you identify exactly where your weaknesses are. So there are a bunch of ways you can adjust, right? Obviously you can switch a Pokemon entirely, but you can also consider readjusting your EV spreads or teching in specific moves. And Dynamax makes this a lot cooler where you can tech in a move specifically to use while you're Dynamaxed for matchups. So there's a lot of ways to adjust your team. Uh, I think a lot of people often just like to switch their Pokemon out immediately, but just even editing your move sets or EV spreads uh, to optimize them against certain bad matchups, I think is really important as well. So this might be a little bit abstract, so I wanted to give you guys an actual example to demonstrate. This is the team that I built for my online battle series, Road to Ranked, and I basically built it within a day. So for me, the idea was to create this anti-meta team that countered a lot of different uh, popular strategies that were going around. So I actually wanted to start with Galarian Weezing because it has a really unique ability and it is quite defensive. So I start with this Galarian Weezing, I make it pretty defensive, and I'm like, okay, now I want to flesh out a core. So in my head, my core, I wanted, you know, Galarian Weezing isn't very good offensively. It's good against things that it can hit for super effective against, but otherwise it's mainly there to use its ability and spread Will-O-Wisp. So then I think to myself, okay, I probably want some heavy hitters, both from the offensive side and the, uh, or sorry, the physical side and the special side. So... Uh, the next Pokemon I added was Arcanine because it's faster than the Weezing, uh, it's got Intimidate, it's got Will-O-Wisp, and it can do a lot of good damage as well with something like Flare Blitz or even Close Combat. So now I've got Arcanine and the Weezing, and I'm like, okay, I probably want a special type attacker, and I am really, really weak to ground at this point. Both uh, Arcanine and Weezing will just faint to something like an Earthquake or an Earth Power, and with Excadrill and Gastrodon being common, I want something to maybe go around that. So to patch up that weakness, I'm looking for a special type attacker that can really complement these two. Rotom Wash was perfect for the purpose of this team. Not only is it able to hit nicely from the special side, but it's also able to uh, be immune to ground type attacks, and that's great. So that was kind of my core and now I'm going and adding to this core and kind of this is where like the domino effect comes into a play as well So the next Pokemon I was interested in at this point was uh, I wanted something that can resist electric type attacks and rock type attacks Because as you can see none of my Pokemon at this point can resist either of those So something that was perfect for that was a ground type Pokemon and Gastrodon fit the bill perfectly um, I was at this point looking more towards special Pokemon because a lot of people are trying to counter physical type Pokemon in general uh, and I don't want Pokemon that are easily susceptible to something like Will-O-Wisp. So Gastron was perfect here. Now we've patched up this electric rock uh, weakness where we, now we can switch him better into attacks like Thunderbolt or Max Rockfall, for example. 
At this point though, I am severely lacking in speed control, right? I don't really have Tailwind, Trick Room, Icy Wind, really none of those. So I, I figured, okay, I probably want a means of speed control, but I'm not sure I want Tailwind with this team because things like Gastron and Weezing are just pretty slow. They're also not the Pokemon that make the best use out of Tailwind because they are pretty bulky. And with Tailwind, you typically want attackers that can really sweep through in those couple of turns. So then I was like, okay, maybe Trick Room is a good means of speed control, but I don't want to commit to Trick Room in all my games as well. So Mimikyu is the Pokemon that I ended up adding because it's in that speed tier where I can bow Trick Room and, you know, Trick Room for myself, for Gastrodon and Weezing to really take advantage of, but I can also use it just to reverse my opponent's Trick Room. So um, Mimikyu was the next means and it also gave me more physical damage at this point because at this point I had three special type attackers in Rotom, Gastrodon, and Weezing and only one physical type attacker in Arcanine, so wanted a little bit more coverage. For the last Pokemon at this point, I wanted something else that could do damage, and I was like, okay, well right now I have no resist to Psychic-type attacks, which is probably not great, so maybe a Steel-type Pokemon is great. Corviknight was the initial Pokemon I added uh, because of its ability to Tailwind and get Max Steel Spikes off, but after playing a couple of games, I was like, I don't feel like I'm bringing Corviknight to most games, don't really feel like it fits in with the team, and I kind of need more damage output. So I ended up replacing it for a Choice Specs Duraludon, which ended up being a great replacement because not only uh, does Duraludon do, do more damage, but it's also able to help counter things like a Hatterene NDD, for example, especially with the Choice Specs variant that I was running. So this was kind of the team building process for my end. Basically, I started with one or two Pokemon and just keep building off it. Um, after this, for a lot of times, for example, even after you've built off like the last Pokemon, your team is going to have some pretty glaring weaknesses, and this is why you want to go online and play and see exactly what you're weak to and how to fix those up. And when you're determining how to fix those up, you normally want to get rid of whatever the weak link is, so whatever Pokemon you're not bringing very often, or whatever Pokemon is just not contributing enough to the team. But uh, this is kind of a fast example of how I built my first team in-game. Basically, wanted a good mix of offense-defense, wanted a good mix of abilities, wanted to take advantage of Trick Room potentially, but didn't want to hard commit to it, and overall had Will-O-Wisp on four different Pokemon to really shut down physical type attackers. So yeah, as you can see, I continuously build off Pokemon rather than just randomly adding Pokemon. If Once again, if you want to randomly add Pokemon, that's probably good to do at the start where you can like say, okay, let me start with these two or three Pokemon and then look at the weaknesses of those two or three Pokemon as a whole and then try to patch those up. So that's pretty much the team building process. I want to talk a little bit about more specific processes. So you might be curious, especially if you're brand new to competitive play, what moves or sets to put on your Pokemon. Uh, Picolytics is an excellent source for this because you can just type in a Pokemon, it'll show you all the top moves that are being used by percentage, and so if you don't know where to start, just honestly start with like the top five or six moves and pick four of them. Um, that would probably be a pretty good starting point. Competitive guys, like I mentioned, from content creators is always great, and if you just watch battle videos from top players and content creators, you'll get a sense of basically what top sets are typically like. When in doubt, throw in Protect on your Pokemon. I see this happen a lot where players like will have teams and like none of the moves will have Protect because they're used to singles backgrounds, and Protect is just a really good move in VGC and doubles. Uh, you typically probably won't be needing all four offensive attacks on your Pokemon, uh, so if you've got something that has, for example, uh, a Berry or a Life Orb, consider running Protect because it's always just a great move and adds more mind games. One thing that's new about the Dynamax feature is that it allows you to tech moves in. So for example, choice uh, Solar Beam on Duraludon. You're never going to use that when you're not Dynamax, but when you're Dynamax, you can use it to snipe something like Gastrodon or protect on choice item users. Now you can, um, you know, use Max Guard while you are choice block, basically. Um, or not choice lock. I mean, once you Dynamax and you use a choice attack, you can still use Max Guard from Protect. So that's one thing that can catch your opponents off guard, especially if they see that you're a choice user earlier on. In general, your items always want to match your Pokemon's role, so for example, if you're using something offensive like Dragapult, you'll probably want something like a Life Orb, Choice Scarf, Choice Band, Choice Specs even. If you're using something bulkier like a Corviknight, you'll probably want like Leftover, Citrus Berry, maybe something like Lumberry for example. Uh, basically, the more offensive Pokemon typically want more offensive items, and the more defensive Pokemon want more defensive items. However, you don't always need to follow the norm, surprises can really pay off. A good example of this is when Ray Rizzo innovated bulk Bulky Thunderous in 2011. Uh, back in that format, everyone had basically used Thunderous offensively with like Life Orb or Electric Gem. And then Ray said, you know what, I'm going to make a really bulky bold variant with um, Charty Berry that can counter Terrakion. And that kind of like shocked the metagame, like no one really thought of that, and that really complete, completely changed the way people thought about really building spreads. So. You definitely don't have to follow the norm. If you want to run Dragapult, it doesn't always have to be offensive. I've seen support Dragapults where you run like Will-O-Wisp, Ally Switch, Screens, for example. So uh, you certainly don't have to follow the most conventional path. Just make sure that whatever thing you are doing actually has good justification behind it. 
As for EV spreads, once again, I think the best places to start off for this are Picolytics, Georgie VGC's showdown stats, and, or sorry, Jory, and, um, and showdown exports from uh, Victory Road. Basically, from these, you can just see what spreads people are using and kind of use them as a starting point. Uh, I want to make a more in-depth guide on this in the future on how to really construct EV spreads, but I always think it's also not bad to just take spreads that people have made because they're probably going to be pretty good. Um, do watch out for the more nuanced stats because if you don't understand why there's a certain amount of bulk on a certain Pokemon, like that's not good. You want to understand like what attacks it's actually able to survive. But I would say that through Picolytics, uh, Picolytics, Story VGC, and the sample spreads from rental teams, it's a good starting point. It'll give you a lot of good... Uh, ideas uh, to begin with and I, you, know, you shouldn't feel bad for just taking one of those spreads and adapting it as you go along however if you are interested in making your own ev spreads which i would recommend as you get a little bit more into the team building process i always look at speed first you want to make sure that you outspeed anything you need to so hit the speed tier stat that allows you to for example outspeed a certain pokemon 100 percent of the time even if they're max speed hit a speed tier stat where when you have tailwind or trick room you're always going to be outspeeding things um that's always the first thing i look to it's obviously more important i would say for offensive pokemon more so than defensive pokemon but in general speed is really important if you're trying to EV for offense, you typically want enough EVs to maybe guarantee a one-hit KO on certain Pokemon. And similarly, on the defensive end, you want enough EVs to survive a common attack. So, for example, if I'm EVing something, I might want to have enough EVs to guarantee that I can survive a Max Quake from Life Orb, uh, Dynamax Excadrill, for example. So, uh, as you play the format more, you'll understand like what attacks we should benchmark against. And because the format's still new, I don't even have like the best examples for this. So, once I do, and once the format becomes a little bit more standard, or not standard, but people play it more, then I'll make a more in-depth EV guide. But in general, there's obviously three main components of making spreads, speed, offense, and defense, and you need to consider the role of the Pokemon, right? So if you're using a bulkier Pokemon, then you'll probably focus more on the defensive EV uh, and rather than like offense and speed. And if you're using like a stronger hitter, then you'll probably want offensive and speed uh, more so. I, I really don't think you should feel bad for using 252, 252, four spreads. Like Shomo Honami, who won the 2015 World Championships, had a ton of those spreads and his team was incredibly complex in terms of how you played with it. But in terms of spreads, like even I was surprised by that. I was like, wow, like that's kind of cool that he was able to win using some of like these spreads i think a lot of players dive into vgc and they're like i need the most complicated spreads i need to survive all these attacks i need to do all these damage calculations but especially when you're starting out and it's a brand new metagame i don't think there's really much shame in going for 4 252 252 uh, once certain pokemon become more centralized and common then you can ev to survive those attacks but when you're starting out really don't feel too bad about it otherwise the resources i linked are all really good in terms of uh figuring out how to really um yeah, figuring out what uh, like spreads you might want to try out from the start. Like when I was making my team, I was like, okay, I'll just see what's common uh, and go from there. Uh, if and you know, take some spreads here and there and adapt them. Um, and you know, in the example that I was using, for example, I know that I want my team to be really defensive, so basically completely neuter physical attackers. So a lot of it was putting in a lot of bulk on, for example, something like Weezing, where I have like max HP and max defense. You definitely shouldn't be afraid to think out of the box. Um, I think a lot of people look at VGC and they're like, wow, like it's always the same Pokemon being used. And that's obviously not the case. We actually have tons of cool examples of really obscure, unique Pokemon winning. Uh, but of course, if you're thinking outside the box and you're using something that's not very common, it should have a really good specific niche role to fill. Pachirisu is a great example. If you watch the World Championships in 2014, Sage on Park won with Pachirisu. He didn't win with it because it was his favorite. He won with it because it was a bulky follow me user that was an alternative to Amoongus. Everyone was countering Amoongus at that world championship because it was really the only viable follow me user at the time. Everyone was using safety goggles to get around it, for example, running safety goggles on Talonflame. So Seijin said, I'm going to find another redirection user that no one's using and that people haven't prepared for. And of course, it paid off perfectly. No one else used Pachirisu in that tournament and it ended up winning the World Championships. You need to find a Pokemon's niche though and build around it, not just say I'm going to use this Pokemon for the sake of using it. A lot of the best non-standard Pokemon often thrive in support roles. If you look at the World Championships from the last couple of years, some examples are Gothitelle in 2011, Executor in 2012, Magmar in 2013 with Follow Me, also on Sejong Park's team actually, 2014 Pachirisu, Entei in 2015, which was used kind of as like a bulky support Pokemon that can spread burns, uh, 2016 Raichu on Wolf Glick's team, and 2017 Klefki on Sebastian Escalante's team. The point is, you can make any Pokemon work theoretically, but you need to find what makes that Pokemon unique. I think a lot of Pokemon are like, I want to try out this Pokemon, and then it ends up just being a worse version of something else that you can use. Rather, find what makes that Pokemon, like, what makes it really special. Is its ability? Is this its moveset? What does it do that nothing else can do? And then how do you support that properly? Uh, of course, 
you know, non-standard Pokemon can also work offensively. I just think typically at a high level, they work more in support roles, but you de you definitely shouldn't like be discouraged from trying out something solely because of that. Um, of course, we see some really cool offensive stuff work that's outside of the box every now and then as well. And some examples of cool meta picks let, you know, these are Pokemon that I didn't really give coverage of in the earlier slides. These are all Pokemon that uh, top cut the Galar Weekly that's held by VGC stats. And a lot of cool stuff, right? You've got Halucha, you've got Sojourner, you've got the, or Stonejourner, you've got the Lapras, Roserade even. So this is just early meta impressions, but the fact that all these Pokemon can top cut a major tournament with like tons of different Pokemon, I think is really uh, healthy for the format. I think it should encourage you to not feel bad about trying out new stuff. Even if it doesn't work immediately, uh, you know, don't give up. You want to find niches and then basically work around those. So to conclude, after you build your team, there are some really important questions that you want to ask yourself. I mean, we've already talked a lot about this. So I don't really want to you know, go really into great detail, but speed control is important. Bulk versus offense is incredibly important. The synergy that we've, uh, you, you've constructed is important. And then finally, no major weaknesses. If you feel comfortable with most of these checkpoints, then you probably have constructed a team that is good enough to uh, you know, do well in. And then at that point, it's more about your gameplay rather than uh, how your actual team functions. But yeah, feel free to you know stay on this slide, take a screenshot or whatever, and just ask yourself these questions after you've built your team. And ideally, you'll have good answers against all of it because uh, the I think I think the best teams probably will have solid answers against all of these. What if you've watched all of this and you still have no idea what's going on and you're still lost? First of all, don't worry. Pokemon, I think, is a really hard game because not only does it have the battling aspect, it also has the team building aspect. And team building, in my opinion, is really like an art. No team is ever perfect, not even the teams that win the World Championships are ever perfect. There's so much to learn when you're just starting out and battling itself is already incredibly difficult. So one thing I often recommend newer players is just to try out a top performing team, a rent like whether it's a rental team or a team you've seen on Showdown or maybe online. Like, you shouldn't feel bad for trying out a team that people have made public because they made it public for a reason. And I think for a lot of starting players, they get discouraged because they think, oh, I'm so bad at this game, like, it's uh, I, I keep losing. And the reality is a lot of the times it's that your team probably is just a little bit weaker, and so you're at a disadvantage because of your team. And of course, if you're already at a disadvantage there, then the battling is just going to be infinitely harder. So if you're really lost, don't feel bad for taking someone's team, adjusting it, or even just playing games with it. A lot of top players even do that for major tournaments. Well, they'll look at what's common, they'll look at a team that's done well, and then adjust it to their liking. So I, I think that's a really important concept to remind yourself. Like, team building is an art in Pokemon, and I've been playing competitively for 10 years, and I still don't think I'm a really good team builder. But Something that I do think I've been able to do successfully was looking at, hey, these are things that fit my play style, these are things that I like playing with, let me take it and then adjust it accordingly. So I think that's a really important point to remember, and if you get discouraged because you feel like your team is bad, trust me, it is so hard to build a good team in competitive Pokemon, especially in BGC, so you really shouldn't feel bad. Anyway, guys, that is going to cover it for this team building guide. Thank you so much for watching. I have rambled on quite a bit and I did repeat myself a bunch, so I do apologize for that. But I hope you found it helpful. I hope the graphics were helpful to some extent. And I hope that with all the resources that I've linked in this video, as well as the video itself, you'll have a good foundation to now build your VGC team. Uh, if you have specific questions, of course, please feel free to ask me in the comments below. In the future, I'd like to maybe do a video on how you can build around some more obscure Pokemon, because some people watching this might not want to just say use like uh, the pool of you know 50 or 70. Pokemon that a lot of people are using. So I totally get that. But once again, this guide was really meant to cover the basics and fundamentals for you to really just get a decent understanding of what team building uh, in BGC looks like. If overall, if I had to summarize, it's basically not just throwing in a bunch of random Pokemon together, but it's making sure that they have synergy and that you have all your bases covered in terms of offense, defense, typing, synergy, and whatnot. And uh, yeah, that's going to be it for this one, guys. I've been talking for a while, so thank you for watching. Leave a like if you enjoyed. Please share with anyone that might be interested in getting into competitive Pokemon or VGC. All the time stamps in the description below if you want to skip to certain points once again. And yeah, it's going to be it for this one, guys. I will see you next time. All right, peace.